One was the uh, centralization of power according to constitution. And then the second one, of course, is you said your PhD on political networks. Um, just to clarify that according to the constitution, our system is not a centralized political system. It's a semi-parliamentary, semi-presidential system. We have, of course, copied the US system, but there is a difference. In the US, uh, the president has the, the final authority to decide on legislative affairs, uh, while according to the constitution, the parliament uh, in our system has the final uh, authority to make the, the, the legislative decision. Now, uh, this is an open debate. We have to talk about whether it's the individuals who actually centralize uh, power in their hands. And apparently, the current administration, uh, administration under which Mr. Sharon is working is regarded as one of the, um, the most centralized uh, and power-centric government mm -hmm. in, in our history, I would say. And that leads to, uh, to appointments based on political networks. Uh, you only can get your recruitments of being approved by president if you know somebody close to him if, or if you know him. So the merit-based appointments of, of the young generation in uh, Europe, uh, representing New Afghanistan uh, is still a challenge for us. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, the power uh, is not only look at from the palace politics, but also from the president's office politics, which is centered between three, four people. Anyways, I would like to open up the question to the, the floor to the question and comments. Uh, Mariam John, you have the floor. Please introduce yourself and your affiliation of organization. Um, my name is Mariam Safi. I run a local think tank in Kabul by the name of Drops. Um, my uh, question is for um, uh, Deputy Minister uh, Sharon. Um, my, my question is, um, I, I very much agree with you in terms of uh, giving more authority and power to the district governors and of course district level governance structures to be able to appoint and implement their governance and planning system. The initial idea in the early 2000s was that because of the lack of security and various other issues at the subnational level, we have to concentrate power and authority to Kabul, particularly Kabul being seen as an institution to implement the democratization, so-called democratization process in Afghanistan. Um, now, in Afghanistan, we have this sort of uh, conflict between uh, tradition and modernity, uh, democracy and our traditional forms of governance, like the Moloks that you pointed to. Um, if we were to, first question, are we ready for this type of decentralization that you're referring to in, in our context while we still have this clash between trying to bring about a democratic state on the one hand and uh, while still in, uh, maintaining our, 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 um, our informal systems? And second, the, the informal structures in Afghanistan like the Maliks and the Jirgas, these are institutions that have also been shaped and changed by the dynamics of conflict over the years. Mm. Maliks are not the same Maliks they used to be now. They are power brokers. And uh, they implement the same client-patron relations that we are trying to remove with our democratic system. So if we were to able to bring that about, how would you see this working? Thank you. Mm. Maybe we answer, uh, we have the answer from our panelists one by one, uh, so that you have a well, thank you so much. We're not talking about decentralization at all because um, we have a presidential system. Uh, the president is the head of the government. Uh, the, 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 the government. Um, he has enormous amount of authority. He can delegate some of those authorities. It's, it's similar to uh, uh, what Indonesians did in, in 1992. The Indonesians were about <coughs> to fall apart. 1,600 islands. They decided, no, we want to ensure, we want to we want to remain as a nation. And the way they did it, they had a strong presidency, but they also gave delegated a lot of those authorities to the districts. So first of all, we're not talking about decentralization. We're talking about central, central state, centralized system. But within that centralized system, you have a lot of power to maneuver. What that means is that. You keep, you keep the four key functions of the state, the four key functions of the state. You keep security within, in Kabul, you keep taxation in Kabul, revenue generation in Kabul, you keep regulatory framework or policy development in, in Kabul, 
and you keep the foreign policy in Kabul. That keeps it very, very powerful. Because when we're talking about security, the president automatically, regardless of, of, of uh, the insecurity level of the districts, his, his command would be delivered all the way to the districts. So the four key functions of the state will remain in Kabul. In the policy, we are already giving some functions to the districts on, fi on five key areas. Water management, electricity, schooling, well, we need to define whether the primary and secondary education will solely go to districts, health, and road. And again, we need to define 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers road within that district will be the responsibility of the district governor's office. So already we're giving five key functions of the state delegating to the district. And this is where the confusion is. I don't think anyone in Afghanistan, none of our experts in Afghanistan have studied this thoroughly. They confuse, they confuse centralization and decentralization. You have a centralized state, but within the centralized state, you can, your ability to maneuver is incredible. What that means at the district level is this. If you give five key functions to the districts, which we are right now giving, we give, we're giving the people the authority to plan. And again, this is something already happening at the provincial development plans <coughs> are, built, are, are, are being gathered from the provinces. But that's not more enough. That's not enough. We need to shift to the districts where the service delivery is happening and to improve the legitimacy of the city. So collect all those plans. Collect all those plans. Shift it to the national budget. And this is what's not happening. Anyone right now can simply shift a budget from one district to another district, simply because they're powerful. You lock it. You say, this school needs to be built in this district because the people demanded it. They had a voice in the process. <coughs> and therefore, that budget should be executed there. The district governor's office, including with the, with the line directorates at the district level, <coughs> will be all responsible for service delivery. Accountable to the district, office, uh, district governor's office, then district governor's office will be accountable, upward accountable to us, downward to the population. So you do lock planning, budgeting, and citizen assemblies, which creates a, a, a fantastic loop of accountability, where you then keep officials accountable on, on the delivery or uh, effective delivery of services. Yeah, I think there will be more doing. questions about this, Mashallah. Oh, Rahila, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I confused yes. you with your sister. <laughs> Um, uh, first of all, Sharon. Sharon. Sharon said it um, was an excellent presentation. I really loved it. Um, secondly, I very much agree with your ideas that um, we really need to divide the task between the central uh, office of the government and uh, also to the provincial data. Um, which was always my concern when I was a senior advisor to the Civil Service Commission in Afghanistan. I think um, this is all what we want. It is our desire that we have to see that the service delivery goes to the um, provincial level mm -hmm. and the accountability should go to the provincial level. And then uh, the policy, I would say, that uh, should come through the consultation process from the situational analysis to developing and formulating policy at the ministry level, rather than going top down where the procurement law was developed at the Ministry of <coughs> Finance, which was not implementable at the provincial, the provincial level. So my question here is how do you, and also on another hand, we have parliament legislative body, yeah? which represent the society, the community, the people, how much they are uh, accountable to the citizens has a, has a, has a logistic, legislative body of the government. Then to make the executive body of the government accountable to the citizens. Uh, so my question is, how do you see this process of structural <coughs> adjustment that responds these questions of the people First of all, to see these three bodies of the government, that how they, how, how these functions that you say,
could work well in this situation? And what is your hope for the way forward? That how how this will happen? Mm. Yeah. Uh, I, I encourage uh, my very good friend Ola to also respond uh, to that question. It's a very very important question. So right now, for those of you who are not aware, we have the uh, the legislature, the parliament. Then we have provincial council representative at the provincial level, and then the district council, and then the village council. So we have four different layers of political representation. Yeah, constitution speaking, yes. But the district council elections never happened. We are now pushing to, for it to happen. Um, the village council election never happened. Uh, unfortunately, we need to make sure that this, this happened. And it's a daunting task because we have 40, 45,800 villages in the country and 387 districts. So one of the arguments that I am pushing for advocating is to reduce the number of districts in Afghanistan, to reduce the number of villages in Afghanistan. It is not ideal for a small country like us, especially at the time we have rapid urbanization going on in the country. By 2022, 40%, 40 to 45% of our population will be living in the cities. So that's, again, that's the different argument. Now what happens is that leg the legislature in Kabul uh, keep the national government accountable. The national government accountable. The provincial council is supposed to keep the provincial governors and the directors, ministry directors, line directors accountable. But often this doesn't happen. In the history of two years of work for Afghan government, I have not received a single report from any provincial councils in the country saying this governor is doing this, this district governor is doing that. Or this line director is doing this and that. <coughs> and this is where the problem lies. Because those councils are captured. Some of those councils, unfortunately, are captured. So the primary objective for me as an official working on the government <coughs> is to how to avoid council capture. Um, and ensure that those officials who are actually part of the uh, representative process <coughs> They're not abusing their, their power. Now, what I would suggest personally doing is a, there's a lot of councils. So we need to reduce the number of districts, reduce the number of councils. We need to have the village council elections happening because right now the citizen charter, which is one of the most rep uh, political representative, or, uh, sorry, one of the most important and essential programs that ensures political representation. 50% women participation we have at the village level, right now. But this is not institutionalist, it's part of the program. It has to come under a village council headed by a Malik representative, and then that goes to cluster CDCs, what we have CDCs, Community Development Council, which is basically should be a village council, and cluster villages, and then all the way this needs to be properly looped, linked from village to district, province, and to the central government. That alignment doesn't exist right now, and it's creating a lot of confusion. That's an area you have uh, been working on. So the parliament should keep the national level accountable, the provincial council, <coughs> the district council should keep the, uh, 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 the, the provincial administrative unit and district administrative uh, accountable, but this doesn't happen. And that's a dilemma uh, I'm struggling myself to help with. Um, Ms. Ashraf uh, was also working as a senior advisor to the president on local governance, so I'm sure she has a lot to share. But one addition uh, to, uh, to your point is about the accountability. Uh, account <coughs> the government, uh, the head of state, the president, received direct votes from the people, and so does the parliamentarians. Um, and there is, um, and, and both are responsible and accountable to the people. What is lacking in the system is having somebody who is the head of executive branch. We have the parliament speaker who is the head of the legislative body, and then the, the chief justice who is the head of uh, Supreme Court, and then the president usually regards himself as the head of uh, executive body. And therefore, there is a clash of power and a clash of oversight between parliament and executive. Therefore, I think, um, speaking about decentralization and accountability, um, the position for a prime minister to be accountable for the 
needs of the uh, executive is uh, essential, perhaps, for the future politics. But uh, Ordala John. Uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, a few uh, general words. And uh, is it the right time or not? Mariam John was saying just very briefly, in my opinion, uh, uh, to, to wait for it uh, for the right time, it will never come. Uh, I think we are, uh, we have been under this very kind of poisonous uh, uh, influence of those who are for a very strong uh, centralized, like the, in the way that uh, Dr. Sharon has explained, uh, systems, and we are also having another extreme of someone who keeps and coming and like blowing things uh, around, you know, federalism. Uh, neither of these are actually our reality, nor it has to be our reality. Uh, my p period of working as a president advisor on subnational <coughs> governance was only three months. So in the course of three months, at least I managed to, uh, to get some kind of a very raw draft of <coughs> something that later on became the roadmap for uh, subnational governance. My struggle at that time was to basically uh, begin with actually definition of what layers of subnational governance do we have? Because the initial policy was not really a policy. It was a dictionary size uh, collection of uh, what do you call that? Regulations. Regulations, right? Procedures. It's procedures. 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 It was not even like you know policies. So to, to turn, to move from that to say that how we define the village, how we define the district, how we define the municipality, what are the municipal governance uh, sort of uh, structures and uh, uh, functions? What are the district governors and what are the village governors? That, that was the actual um, uh, thing that I did. But even within that draft that I have prepared, and one thing that it faced challenge, and I was told by people from inside the government, was that you were a little bit too ambitious in terms of delegation of authority. Yes, I was, and, and it is probably still you know, under uh, discussion. Why? Because I was saying, look, there is a policy called provincial budgeting and planning or something. Planning, both planning and budgeting. Provincial budgeting and planning, right? The regulation or the policy under this title is entitling two people at the subnational level to decide about the budgeting of the province. The governor in governor's office and the um, Mustufi, which is the head of the finance ministry. And I said, okay, so where are district governors here? And they make it, I don't know whether it is intentional or unintentional because they confuse the administrative aspect of governance with the actual authoritative and the political aspect of governance. Because a district governor or Wollitzwald administratively is under the governor, mm -hmm. but not necessarily politically. Because politically, he represents this, the state at the district level. And this is since the Abdurrahman Khan time, and after that, we never really expanded on the state building, to be honest, right? Like the, the last stop for when, where the government ends is district. Beyond that, we don't have anything formal as a, a, a sort of a, a reflection or representation of the state. Um, my other point was also related to this um, uh, issue of representation. Dr. Sharon very nicely explained it, and just to sort of give you a, a sense of like what we are doing in terms of representation. The, the, the source of problem in terms of representation, in my opinion, comes with a kind of a wrong selection for the parliamentary, uh, uh, for the election system, the SNTB, the secret non vote transferable, uh, transferable single, single, uh, single, sorry, single, single non-transferable. Uh, uh, non-transferable vote. So SNTB is not really, like, because of this system, we can have five people from one district, and we can have no people from five other, or 10 other, or 20 other districts. Mm -hmm. I look at the district of Negrahar, majority of MPs are coming from one or two districts. Yeah. And there, there are 20 t 22 districts in the, in the province. So what happens to the representation? Lack of political representation results in, in this kind of patronage system that we live, it results in lack of attention to those areas, lack of attention results an open space for all kind of other external troublemakers to use the, the land for Daesh activities, for terrorist activities and whatever. So I think um, a gradual form of delegating authority, a gradual form of uh, actually allowing the uh, state representation at the district level, I think I'm in full agreement and that and, and like my focus has been district and village in my own research, and what I found was that there is a full <coughs> readiness among the people. Okay, the fear is like how 
you will not turn. Okay, I agree that if you give too much authority to, to the governors, that's a risk. Because governors are at a prone, uh, they are prone to this risk of, you know, turning themselves into empires. We have the examples in all regions of Afghanistan. I mean, we all know it from north to, to east to, uh, to west to south. Uh, but if you go and break it down to 400, then it is not really, uh, it's not going to be the small island. It is expanding actually the power of the state to the very local level and also actually bridging this gap between you know, the center and the, the periphery or the, the locals and something that now Taliban are actually trying to, to build up on and say we are the rurals and the villagers and you are the city people and that's why we are winning which is not true. I mean, I, I think the people in the village, in the rural areas, we all know that they are taken hostage by the Taliban. If you go to them, neither the Taliban could control. I have, a, I don't know, want to go out of this discussion, but this whole um, notion of, you know, the Taliban could control this place and these maps would come with the green and yellow and, I don't know, red colors, mm -hmm. I find it hugely problematic because there is no such thing as control. Mm -hmm. By the way, neither the government, due respect to my dear friend from government, <laughs> Interesting discussions, perhaps another session on the uh, electoral system in Afghanistan and who controls where um, by um, Dr. Muradian. We request next session. Uh, we have the last question or comment. And then, uh, how do you say? Sure, so two more before we end. Good morning. I am a uh, PhD researcher at King's College London, and I'm also, I also have the benefit of being a research fellow with AISS, and I've been able to do a lot of research on the SNTV system that you've just talked about. Now, I, I don't want to make it too academic either, because I know that, but you, that said, we have a privileged um, panel that has a very strong academic background with a lot of practice experience as well. And in your presentations, you, you very directly talk about the issue of power, but none of you mentioned the issue of the word power. I, I want to actually uh, interrogate this, uh, the issue of power and distribution and the way you talk about it in your varying presentations because uh, there are a lot of interests that are um, implicated when we have the devolution of power and if they're distributed in different ways it can have drastically different impacts. So I wonder if you could, if I could propagate that a bit more and to make it very uh, uh, specific in, doc in uh, Dr. Orzala's presentation, you mentioned how there are existing power structures and a lot of it has to do with foreign influences and uh, being very much uh, a lot of rigidity, but th there is a new social phenomena that's occurring with the young people. But what is the process of transformation in uh, young being able to, you could say, um, reconfigure some of the existing power structures? Because it's not like education by itself is enough to break down power, uh, existing power structures. So there has to be like a, a structural uh, a process as well. Uh, like a, uh, a, a, a process of socialization. So I wonder if you could go into that a bit more. And uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sharan, in the, in the, there could be potentially two things you're saying with uh, the, the devolution of uh, authority. You could be saying that there's more representation that is being uh, established at the local levels, or you could be saying that this representation is actually a means of centralization. Not the way we usually understand it, but devolution can be a means of centralization. And if in the case of the latter, how then do you ensure that that type of devolution doesn't uh, create rigidity in the power structures that centralization was meant to break down to begin with? Because the whole uh, centralization in some ways, one of the goals, whether it's maintained or not, is to break down the actual uh, 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 structures locally. So how do we ensure that through devolution, if it's meant to create centralization, you're not actually uh, creating rigidity in these local structures. Mm. Uh, in the interest of time, I would like to take one more. I'm sorry, I, uh, thank you for being patient. I did not realize your hand was up. So please, uh, Professor Hanafi. Uh, I just uh, uh, would like the panel to uh, realize that we are very grateful to uh, your description, your narrative, and your observation uh, about the, uh, the uh, overall structure and some details of the Afghan society. Um, uh, I'm struck by uh, uh, two, uh, one uh, uh, 
effort was made to uh, the elite of outside being dependent, dependent, and the Kabul center being dependent as well. I would like to see that develop. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm sure you all know uh, the textbooks that are used in the schools of Afghanistan are produced uh, way outside uh, the country uh, in uh, countries in North America. If you could observe, uh, share your observations about uh, are you reading of that uh, reality? What does that mean that the textbooks that are produced and used in the schools of Afghanistan are produced uh, at the University of Nebraska? What do you mean? What do you think of that? So you both have two minutes each um, to have your concluding remarks, but also address some of the questions. I'm sorry if we are not able to take all the questions because I'm sure the next panelists are waiting here. Uh, we would like to be on time, so please. Thank you. Uh, so I probably will start with the, the, the sort of the young generation and how that sort of recon reconfiguration, as I was talking about, is happening. Uh, you know, the reason I end, up why, why, uh, I end my little remarks uh, by that kind of positive note is first we are in an extremely worrying and concerning situation in Afghanistan and we always search for you know things to energize us to keep on going because for us it's not the option of packing and leaving for when I say us here I talk about the 35 million population who don't have a choice so uh, and then second I'm not just saying this as a kind of making my speech look beautiful but I have you know examples in mind uh, right now we have you know, a generation of uh, youth uh, in businesses, in governments, at the deputy ministerial uh, uh, positions in lower, if not at the ministerial, because we are still kind of under the influence of those elites and how to consider A and B and C and D kind of groups and not to make anyone upset. So to an extent that is considered in the sort of um, very top level of decision making. We are not uh, entirely satisfied. But the medium technical level, a lot of young Afghans who have studied abroad or have studied within the country and have gained a lot of knowledge, experience, and think about you know our international partners. They come at a maximum for one year. Uh, and then think about the Afghans. They are there for like 18 years. So there is like a wealth of experience. If you look at the civil society and NGO sector, if you look at the government sector, that's the case. Uh, and I'm also thinking about you know plenty of examples. Look at the peace, um, uh, the, the people's peace movement, the guys from Helmand who started to walk mm -hmm. all the way to Kabul and the kind of queues be behind them and people joining them. Um, the, there are so initiatives by people who are trying, like by this young Afghan who is going around and encouraging uh, people to send their girls to school. For example, the music orchestra who are right now in, this, uh, in London and trying to have, you know, these are like positive examples. And I'm just saying, you know, everyone who thinks that this all will go away and then we will be led by the Middle East, uh, the, the Stone Age people, it's like impossible. You, you, how many of these will be, you know, killed or disappeared or whatever? With an exception, of course, of coming back to that point related to, to the elite. Um, I may have not made it very clear on my side, but when I explained about the elite and the elite definition, I didn't make a distinction between the rural and urban or co-op center or the periphery elite. So I talk about elite in general in Afghanistan. Uh, if elite isn't within a, a village setting, um, I see the new emerged uh, uh, elite within the village, uh, uh, for example, in the form of a commander. Uh, at the moment, who is quite influential, or in the form of a, uh, an NGO director who lives in this village. Uh, at the very top level, we all know who are the elites. So both have an, the, a source of their legitimacy, a source of their power, or the, their definition as an elite, which is externally funded. It can be through all kind of. The Taliban commander is uh, similarly. If we consider a Taliban commander in a specific locality and consider that person as a powerful person to con to like make decisions there, where comes his legitimacy from? It's not simply because he has access to resources. Resource there is, for example, control over violence or having access to weapons. But there is an external dependency that makes him <coughs> generally an elite. So to me, it's more that kind of way of looking at it. And in general, for example, in Dijon, uh, in Putzel, two uh, scholars who, who, were who were giving a list of the definition on the elite, they did not add, for example, this external factor. And we see in Afghanistan that it's quite evident that these people were non-existing if they were not funded by external forces.
from the Soviet and the Soviet war, all of up until now. Is and the Kabul ruling machinery dependent on outside? They are. Each one of them have a dependency but outside. The machinery, the, the structure. The, the structure, <laughs> well, yes, because that's historical uh, uh, fact. You know, from, from, from the late 18th century up until now, state buildings, the state institutions generally, with some exceptions in the middle, they have always been externally funded. And that's another major question for us as Afghans to see how we can, if we can survive, you know, uh, without external dependency. Well, our speakers, uh, the panelists will be, uh, of course, available through the day. So any uh, further uh, conversation with them, of course, they're available. Mr. Sharon, you, but uh, please, because I'm sure we have I was listened. hoping that I would get away with it. <laughs> But thank you so much. Uh, your, uh, I, I found both of your questions very, very interesting. Um, let, let me just reiterate the reason that I pointed out uh, this discussion uh, was simply to uh, highlight the, the fact that it, it, it's important to improve the legitimacy of the state and how to do that. State building as a means <coughs> to achieve that can do that. And often, the reason we, are, we have failed in the last 18 years is because we have ignored the local. Okay? And that's where the issue of, of power comes in. The local is immensely powerful. The local has uh, enabled the collapse of the state historically in Afghanistan. The tribal dynamics in certain parts of the country, the regional dynamics in certain parts of the country, has led to the collapse of the state has led to the collapse of, of, of provincial governors. What happened in 2015 in Uruzgan is a primary example of rivalry between the two tribes, and in two hours, 72 checkpoints collapsing. So the key issue becomes, how do you turn that negative power, that people feel powerless, that they don't have a voice, into power, positive power, and then give them voice? give them voice in the decision-making process, in their lives that matters, they should be able to decide where they want to build schools and clinics. Not a bureaucrat sitting in Kabul and saying, well, this much money should go to this district <coughs> to please the patronage system that, that is being played out in Kabul. And that's where the power comes in. You give more power to local people, you give them voice, you give them authority to engage in the decision-making process, that improves the legitimacy of, of their state. And secondly, to me as someone who has uh, worked on local governance in the last two years, the primary factor, the primary purpose of state building in Afghanistan, 17 years down the road, right now should be containing local conflict. <coughs> Issue of representation, in, in, in Nandarhar, you don't have full representation. Shinwaris weren't represented in the last election. They are not represented this time around. You go to Paktika, you go to Paktia, you clearly say, see Sulaiman Khel is overrepresented versus the others. You go to Ghazni, you go to Nan Kandahar. <coughs> the Nurzais and the Isarzais are hardly represented. The Ghilzais and the Kandahar are hardly represented. How do you ensure those historical grievances are managed, okay? through a political system that guarantees representation for everyone and gives them that voice is a key issue. And that's where the primary purpose of state building should be in Afghanistan containing local conflict. So somebody, a grievance in Kandahar between the two elders, it does not become a national issue. It needs to be resolved at that village level, at that district level. It shouldn't spread all the way to Bodhis, spread all the way to Chicago. And that's, I think, that's central uh, argument that I'm trying to make. Great. Thank you very much. We could go on and on, but around the cross to our... Yeah.